You are listening to the Shepherd's Tent Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this teaching from the family. Um, And also over this house, I just want to say over this house, like, it's weird because the only thing I could be, what I was reminded of when I was like walking up the steps was like years and years ago, we actually like went, my wife and my family, we went like up these steps into, uh, you guys all know, upper room now. But it actually was an upper room and it was above a veterinary hospital and nobody knew it existed. (laughs) And so like, but we had a friend of the family who actually was like doing the Sozo sort of healing ministry there. And so we like went up years and years, there's like maybe a hundred people there or whatever. And we just like went to, basically did this, but it was in its infancy. And I feel that same spirit here where it's like, there's something that the dam is about to break, but there's a whole lot of our own woundedness we have to get through first. I think there's just like a ton in the room of like, people are going to come into this room with their own history and their own story. And I want to say this from the very beginning, God does not deliver you from your story. He delivers you from your sin. If you're still trying to get delivered from the eight-year-old version of you, that is not Jesus. That is antichrist in nature. God wants to deliver you from sin. He delivers you from demons. He doesn't deliver you from you. No matter how bad your experience was, you don't get delivered from that. You get the chance to integrate it into your story. Well, if you don't like that version, it's okay. Jesus, after he's resurrected, what does he keep? His scars. Jesus keeps his scars. The one man-made thing in all of heaven is Jesus' scars. The one man-made thing in all of heaven is Jesus' scars. He keeps them after he's resurrected. He keeps his scars for what purpose? For what purpose? He destroys doubt with them. See, I wonder if the very scars we're hiding are the very things that would destroy doubt in a culture about who he actually is. Because wouldn't it have been a better testimony for Jesus to walk up to Thomas and Thomas goes, I don't believe it's really you. And he would have said, like all of us good Christians would have said, is go look at the empty tomb. We keep pointing people to the empty tomb, but what if your life is supposed to be the empty tomb that we're supposed to see? What if your life, your scars, and your story are not supposed to remain hidden, pressed down, repressed, or get delivered from? They're the very things you're supposed to show off to the world so that doubt is broken in the heart of a generation. We actually, listen, and here's the difference. I'm not saying you should make agreement with your abuse or your addictions or the way you were treated, but you can't get away from it. It is what made you you. You can ignore it or you can integrate it, but it doesn't go away. And anything that you don't... (laughs) Anything that doesn't get transformed in your life will be transferred. If you don't get it transformed, you're going to give it away to every person you meet. And you might even call it the gospel. But all you're handing them is dysfunction and your own brokenness. See, we're trying to get our whole... We're try, that's what First Thessalonians tells us. He says, I want you to be whole in body, mind, and spirit. This is what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to just be whole in your, in, in your spirit. He wants the whole thing. He wants your heart and your mind and your spirit. He wants the whole thing because wholeness is the foundation of holiness. If we're going to walk in real holiness, we have to make agreement with the entire story that God gave us. God did not make a mistake when he puts you in that family at that time, in that city, in that space, with those friends, with that school, with all the junk you've gone through. Every single one of it he knew did not choose some of it for you but people's freedom gets sometimes abused towards other people people misuse their freedom and when they do and it becomes a part of your story you either get a chance to be an overcomer and integrate that into your story and use your scars to destroy doubt or you become angry and bitter and frustrated and you let everybody know it and you live there alone for the rest of your life That's why family is so important because there's things you'll share around a family table that you will not share in front of a room of strangers. Guys, have you seen how the church treats sinners? (laughs) 
And we want people to come into the church and confess their sins so they can be healed. They're like, heck no, you eat your own. I'm not going to that. I watch how you all destroy your own. I'm not doing that. You don't cover anybody. These guys are supposed to be your leaders, and you don't cover them. You eat them alive just so that you look better on the other end. Guys, we're supposed to be showing off our junk so that the people who are outside of the church go, oh, if, well, if they're sharing it, guess what I can do? I can bring my junk into the room too because if we're asking for people to behave and believe before they belong, we are doing it backwards. Jesus t- lets people know they belong, then they begin to believe, and then they begin to behave. That's how it works. In the kingdom, in family, we don't demand people behave first. The reason kids will eventually course correct their bad behavior is because they know they have a place to belong. If they don't have a place to belong, they will continue their bad behavior because what do they need? We all know what a kid needs when he's acting badly. What does he need? Attention. You all know, (laughs) you don't even have to be a parent to know what a kid is looking for. A kid doesn't know they belong, so they act poorly to get the attention they need because they're not getting it enough on a regular basis. So of course they're not going to change their behavior because they don't know they belong. Once the whole world knows you belong, regardless of your junk, you belong. I don't need theology for that. See, that's why Jesus was like so, he was so wild because he loved so ridiculously in the midst of people's sin. And he didn't demand they change. Guys, the woman caught in the act of adultery is laying in the middle of the street naked. Caught in the act of adultery. This is not an assumption. (laughs) She was pulled from the bedroom, laid in the dirt. This is Jesus' great message to her. It's super deep. I hope you're all ready. Please don't do that again. This didn't work out, so let's not, let's not do that. He's not like, hey, listen, we got a really great counseling ministry. I want to bring you along. The synagogue has a really great counseling program. We're going to like get you set free from some of this stuff. In fact, you know what? I got a great spiritual father. I'm going to get you in some classes. We're going to bring you to church next week. It's going to be really beautiful. No, he's just like, hey, that was a terrible idea. Uh, you know what? I know it's extra biblical, so you can all stone me later, but I really do believe in my heart of hearts when I see that image, I believe the first thing he did was take off his own cloak and cover her nakedness the same way God covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve in the garden. I bet he knelt down covered her nakedness, and when her shame was covered, he could say, let's not do this again. That's his big message to a woman caught in the act of adultery. Really deep and profound, huh? Like, really. Striking the theology he gives us in that moment. Let's not do that again. But isn't that kindness? See, that's the big message today. I'm going to beat up on men for a while, so you guys are all lucky to be here. Congratulations. Like, man, I'm super sorry you showed up today. But like, at the end of the day, what I want us to know is as sons and daughters, we have access to a father, which I know that is the message of this house, but we have no idea how masculinity operates in the midst of a culture that hates men. Because here's the beginning of the message. Here's the beginning of the the beginning of the beginning. Men go first. From the beginning of scripture to the end of scripture, here's how it works. Men must go first. And the moment we hear that, we go, I knew it, you patriarchal jerk. Systems and structures, men have to be in charge. That's the message. Oh, great. Way to go, Jake, you big jerk. No, men go first. How do men go first? Men go first from beginning of scripture to end of scripture. Men go first in servanthood. And sacrifice first. Men are always supposed to go first. And how do they go first? Servanthood and sacrifice, not systems and structures. A man who doesn't know how to go first in in service and servanthood and sacrifice should never be trusted with a system or a structure.
Because the mark of a real man is servanthood and sacrifice regardless of what they get out of it. That's how you'll spot a real man. Because look at Jesus, God of the universe, Lord of Lord, the whole deal, Savior, Redeemer, let's just go through the list. We find him washing the disciples' feet because a man who knows who they are does not lose who he is when he chooses a lower position. Like a man who understands who they, that's why we know we have so many insecure men in the church because they're all trying to get a microphone. That's the marker of insecurity. I need, if I need this to know who I am, I don't know who I am. I don't need this. Like, I'm going to go back and love my wife and kids regardless of if I ever have this again. I don't need any of this. I don't need this. I do this in my garage when nobody's looking. I like it a lot. It's actually way better if you guys heard it when I was in the garage. So much better. You know, it's like, those are the moments where you're like, God, it was so good. Now I'll try to do it. And then you like get in front of everybody and the Lord's like, no, no. Remember that button? No, you didn't. Exactly. You know, and that's the way it works. Why? Because he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is actually marking men in this hour. And we know that God is, is, is absolutely trying to redeem masculinity in the church because the world is coming so hard against it. We are the first generation in 50 years to be post Roe v. Wade. Now, you have two opportunities in that vacuum, rebellion or fatherhood. Which will it be? We are living in a vacuum where somebody has to stand up and it's either going to be dads or it's going to be a rebellion. And the problem is the church is still celebrating and patting themselves on the back and changing nothing. We're changing nothing. It happened. We prayed. Yay. I love all that. Now what are you going to do? It has to be men. Men have to show up. The desperate need in this hour is not for more churches or more organizations. It's for dads. And the Bible says it. Paul says it. He says, you have 10,000 teachers. You have very few dads. He gives us the problem. What you're lacking in is men who know who they are so that they can actually walk into rooms and the room. Have you ever been around a real dad? Like, I mean, have you ever, like, been in a room and a dad walks in? It's like, like a real dad. And honestly, my, my wife is, I wish she was here to tell you this. The kids, I drove them too hard for 10 days. They're asleep, I think, still, okay? Um, the, they wish they were here. They send their love, but they are definitely crashed out. Um, but my wife, she didn't have a dad. Her dad just abandoned her. She grew up a single, with a single mom as, a, um, as an only child. She could tell you her whole story. She does, like, we, we, we could walk through all of it, super wounded by all the stuff she's experienced with men, masculinity, and fatherhood. But Chris Valentin, who, by the way, I can say on, online, I don't even agree with half the stuff the dude says. I'm okay with saying that. In fact, one of the times we're on the phone and we're like literally in an argument, Chris Valentin from Bethel Church, the prophet guy there, we're, on a, we're in an argument on the phone and he literally stops the phone. Like, it's awesome. He stops it. We've had tons of relationship. He says this. He says, hey, listen, when I get to this point with most people, with most men, this is where they stop and relationship's over. I just want to let you know before we go any further that I will love you and your family for the rest of your lives, regardless of whether or not we agree on this thing. I'm like, that's a father. So when, when, so it's like, we're not going to agree. And it's awesome. Because you don't have to agree. Agreement is the lowest form of intimacy. <laughs> agreement is the lowest. If you're only going to be friends with people you're in agreement with, you're going to have very few friends, and you're all going to pat each other on the butt and say you're all correct, and you're going to be able to impact no one but yourselves. It's literally spiritual masturbation. That's really all it is. Okay? I'm taking it way too far, but I want it to sink in, so now you have a word picture. But that's what it is. You all hang out in your little, little holy parties, but nobody else gets impacted. So you all think you're awesome and walk out and nobody else gets touched. Why? Because I'm only spending time with people I agree with. 
My wife had a huge problem with men. And all of a sudden, I realized like part of our marriage story is me being a total, literally she's dealt with abandonment her whole life. And then she marries a husband who ends up traveling. Of course God lines it up that way. Why? Because you will marry all of your triggers. God ordains it that you will marry all of your triggers. And I'm not talking about the ones you know about. I'm talking about you will marry. If your spouse is triggering you constantly, you know you married the right person. Why? Because God put that person in your life to uncover all those hidden triggers so that they could be healed in the presence of another who loves you regardless. You're supposed to feel triggered with your spouse, so you have to look at the things that are still being wounded in you so that you can actually look at them and say, I want them healed. My wife had been abandoned her whole life by men, and then I'm like, hey, I'm going to travel and change the world for Jesus. And she's like, well, now I'm not sure I like Jesus either, and I definitely don't like you. That's real. You can watch it on YouTube. We like set up a camera and told the whole story because we were like, we got to tell people that this is like... Your calling from God is not your relationship with God. And so my wife walks in with all her wounds. Chris Valentin enters in and goes, how are you doing? And it was the first time she's like, oh, she just started sobbing. My wife never cries. Like, she's like, she's the man of our relationship. I'm like the the crier. You know what I mean? She's like super strong and like, and I'm like, I just love the, the movie. You know, like, I'm just totally, I'm the romantic, you know, the whole thing. But she ends up running into a dad. And when a dad enters the space, you feel safe in areas you've never felt safe before. That's how you know a dad entered the room. Because a dad, regardless of your experience, when the anointing of a father hits the room, you feel safe in the most unsafe places of your entire life. Well, no wonder Paul's like, well, you got 10,000 teachers, but very few fathers. You got a bunch of people who can preach the word really, really well, but you have very few men who can walk into a space, and when they do, the whole space feels safe now. You know who carried that pre-Jesus? I love this. It's John the Baptist. You're like, you're a crazy person. No, I'm not. John the Baptist, what was his main ministry? To tell people they were sinning. And they are walking days into the desert to look at this man who is eating locusts, dressed in camel hair, and they're like, tell me I'm a sinner. He's like, you're a sinner. And they're like, oh, you're right, I am. I love you so. Thank you for telling me. Now put me in the water. You're like, what the heck is happening? No, that's the father's heart. See, we're missing wild men in the midst of our gatherings. We're missing the ones who are a little bit unhinged. And you're like, they're a little dangerous. I'm not quite sure what's going to fly out of their mouth. Like, I don't know. They're, they're kind of, they're, they might be unstable. We love those. We need them because in, in, in tribal cultures, just FYI, they were known as the crazy uncle that you would send your kid to to be initiated. That's who you need in your culture because you're like, hey, listen. You're 13 now. I'm sending you to Jake. And they're like, no, 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 please listen. Look, look, I'll behave. I'll do whatever. I'll get better grades, whatever you, nope. We already bought the plane ticket. You're spending three months with Jake. And they're like, no. That's who I'm setting up to be at 70 years old, just so we're all clear on where I'm headed. I'm going to be the guy that lives between the wilderness and the village that you send your children to. I'm not, I'm not joking. You want to know where I'm headed? I'm headed to start a youth ministry. That's what I'm doing. I'm like doing all of this to get a bunch of men on board so that I can start a junior high group. That's all I want to do. Why? Because if I can get them at junior high, we've got them for the rest of our lives. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, junior high. That's where I learned to preach so I could be a real preacher one day. No. Heck no. That's where the gold is. Give me a room full of junior hires. Give me some freshmen. I love it. Give me them. I'll take all of them. I'm going to initiate thousands of boys. That's what we're going to do. We're going to initiate thousands of boys into a type of masculinity that is unmovable and unshakable in any and all circumstances. That's where we're headed. And when I say that, I'm not talking about repeat after me. I'm talking about dangerous young men who are not, they are not turned at every tide of the culture. They don't wander to and fro. They have deep roots. All of our discipleship is like, hey, do you know that verse? And you're like, yes, I know the verse. 
my life looks like hell, but I can repeat this in front of you and put a smile on my face. You're such a good disciple. That thing is burning to the ground quickly. And I'm just helping light fires. That's all I'm trying to do. And I'm doing it by saying, men, wake up. No, you're not too aggressive. No, you're not delusional. You're actually seeing correctly. But you have no space to live it out. Let me give you the proof. It looks like this. So you're like, just, I'll give you Bible so that way everybody feels like it actually isn't my opinion. 1 Corinthians 12. We love 1 Corinthians 12. It's a teaching on the spiritual gifts. Amen? Yay! Praise God. Paul's like one of the best exhortations on the spiritual gifts. He walks through all of them. We love the spiritual gifts. Then, not only does he give us the spiritual gifts, then he gives us the fivefold. Some were meant to be apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. And we're like, heck yeah, spiritual gifts, fivefold ministry. Amen, hallelujah, end the story. Except for Paul at the end of the chapter says, now let me show you a better way. No, no, Paul, you're so silly. You just taught me about the spiritual gifts and about the fivefold ministry. Isn't that awesome? And he's like, no, no, let me show you a better way. In fact, do you know what the translation actually is for a more excellent way? It actually can't be, tre- it can't be translated properly into words because it's, an actual, it's a word picture. Do you know what the word picture is? It's literally Paul saying, if you want to throw beyond where other people can reach, here's how you do it. He's saying, if you just want to repeat everything that everybody's doing, just keep doing the same thing. If you, want the re- if you want the same results that the church has gotten in the last 40 to 100 to 200 years, then just keep doing the same thing. If you want a different result, then let's try something different. That's what Paul said. He's saying, we've tried religion. Now let's see what happens when we throw a rock further than anybody's ever gone before. And then he says this. Then he backs it up. He's like, let me show you something better. Throw farther than anybody can reach. By the way, if you speak in tongues and don't have love, you're a noise. By the way, if you have faith and you can prophesy and you can move mountains, you are nothing if you don't have love. Oh, you want to be generous and give all of your money and give your body up to the flames? Congratulations, no love, you gain nothing. He just walked back through all the spiritual gifts and we're like, yeah, those don't mean anything unless you have this. And then he says, and then he starts where none of us want to start. He goes, love is patient. And we're like, well, we're out. I mean, we're taught in the church consistently, do not pray for patience. He'll do it. Right? You guys, if you've been in the church for a while, you know people are like, do not pray for patience. Yet I should be asking God for patience every day. It's the very foundation of love. Why would I not be praying for God to make me more patient and then watch how it works out? I mean, you should probably warn your family. Let them know, hey, listen, babe, I'm really sorry. I prayed for patience. If the car blows up tomorrow, it's my fault. And I'm serious about this. There's a reality that many of us as men don't know how to walk through this, let alone the whole church, in a love that is actually patient. What's the next line? Love is patient. Love is? Oh, that's right. You can't be kind if you're in a hurry. See, they build on each other. Patience is the foundation of love because you cannot love in a hurry. Love doesn't happen overnight. You do not fall into love, just like you don't trip into holiness. This stuff takes time. It takes effort. It takes work. It takes focus. It takes energy. Love is patient. Love is then. If you're slowed down enough, you'll actually be kind to the people around you. But if you don't have time and you're not kind, then you'll begin to envy. And envy is different than jealousy. Jealousy says, I don't like that you have it. Envy says, if you have it and I don't, I'm going to make sure you lose it so that we're on equal ground. And then, love does not boast is the next thing. Because once you lose it, and you don't have it, and I don't have it, I'm going to come back to the relationship and tell you about all the things I do have that you don't have because I'm better than you. Love, it just keeps going. It gets really, it just gets worse and worse as you walk through the 16 attributes of love. But let me show you where I'm going. If you go, love always hopes, always protects, always trusts. Love never fails, right? So we know that it goes, love never fails. Now get down to verse 11, and guess what it says? When I was a child, I acted like a child. I talked like a child. But when I became a, okay, it's not a generic term for everybody. It literally is the word man. He literally says, if you heard what I just said to you, 
from 12 to 13, from chapter 12 and chapter 13, when you hear this and begin to apply it, you put childish things away and you become a man. You don't like that version either? It's okay. Just keep going three more chapters. Because in 1 Corinthians 16, then he backs it up even further. The very end of the book, he says, here are some of my final thoughts. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong and do all that you do in love. He's literally letting you know, men, I'm actually setting you up to know how to walk this thing out over the course of your whole life when you're ready. And you're like, well, I don't like that. Oh, that's great. It's okay. Malachi 4. It says, we all know, the great, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the hearts of the fathers will turn to the children. Stop right there. Forget the rest of the verse. Why forget the rest of the verse? Because men have to go first. Dads have to go first. This is not an option for us. Men must go first. Then we go to Ephesians 5 and it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So who's your model for your marriage? Is it your daddy? Is it your uncle? Is it your grandfather? Is it your pastor? Who is your model for your marriage? Jesus and Jesus alone. If it's not Jesus, then don't claim Christianity because he is the model from top to bottom, start to finish. He is our example. And in marriage, it says you have to be willing to give up your life unto death for your spouse. That means when your spouse tells you she doesn't love you anymore, you don't get to bow out. Why? Because your love's coming from a different source. And if your love's coming from a different source, then when your wife says, I don't love you anymore, it hurts you, it affects you emotionally. Even Jesus wept over the reality of Jerusalem, right? He weeps over it. But you don't get to move forward anyway. You have to actually change. Because your love comes from a different source that is not your wife. If your source of love is your wife, your wife is an idol, not your spouse. If you're getting your love from her, number one, you're codependent. That's the psychological term. Number two, it's an adultery. I'm not stealing love from my wife so that I can then give it back to her. I'm getting love from an eternal, everlasting well so that I can lavish her with love the way that she should be loved regardless of what she gives me in return. Is that not what Jesus does for us? Now, it's not convenient, and now men, are, now men don't want me to preach anymore. It's great. It's awesome. It works out wonderfully for me. But I'm like, and some of you in this room, some, some of you have been divorced. And you're like, based on the statistics, half this room has been divorced, maybe remarried once or twice. I am, look, I have wept over this stuff. I am not saying, oh, well, now you're divorced, so it's over. No, that's not what I'm saying. You are responsible for the, what you hear when you hear it. What I'm doing is giving us a standard so that we can set ourselves up for something better because nobody in this room who is divorced got married and was like, I cannot wait to get divorced. Every person who has gone through the heartbreak of divorce says, I wish it would have gone down differently. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. So I'm giving you your wish. We're setting a standard. We're calling men higher. And we're going to do this thing differently moving forward. Does that make sense? And we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When Eve pulls the fruit from the tree, she eats from the tree. Does she realize that she's naked? Nope. Not until she hands it to Adam and Adam bites from the fruit do they both realize they're naked. Why? Because it was the man's responsibility to cover his spouse. And when he abdicated his role, it did not make her responsible. It made him responsible in his silence for the fact that he could not cover his bride and he stayed silent while she was making a bad choice. Can you imagine if we had the kind of husbands on the planet who are like, hey, listen, babe, we're heading down a really bad road. 
let's just course correct this thing. Let's get on our face before the Lord. Let's, let's just change the course. Adam had every opportunity right there to break his silence, to break his shame, to break his guilt, and grab his wife's hand and say, hey, Lord, this is not a road we're going to go down. But do you understand the cost? What was, what's the cost, by the way? If we walk up to our wives and we go, hey, I want to work on something, guess what the cost is? It might break the relationship for a little bit. It might be a painful road to walk down where both of your scars are now exposed. And instead of doing that, we stay silent. Guys, I am hearing, I wish I could share all the stories I've heard in the last year. I've heard the most insane stories. Like men who have, like, in their marriage, and I don't know, this is what's coming to my mind, so I'm just going to say it. Men who have gone through their marriage without having a conversation about sex and then expecting it to all work out okay. Well, I finally brought it up 20 years later. Well, congratulations. You should have brought it up 20 years ago. Now you're bringing it up 20 years later and thought, well, I brought it up just like Jake said, and now it all fractured and blew up in my face. Well, of course it did. You've got 20 years of woundedness you have to backtrack through now. What I'm trying to do is get to men younger and younger and younger and younger and get more courage and more boldness inside of them so we can have the conversations, fix the issues now prior to it being fractured for 15, 20 years and then going back and trying to repair it. Some of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. Years and years of brokenness and conversations that should have happened. And I am going to tell you men, I am not trying to be a jerk, but it is your responsibility. Stop waiting for your wife to have the conversation. Show up and have some courage. And I mean that as lovingly and sincerely as possible. Your kids need this. Your spouse needs this. Your community needs this. We need men who can operate with this kind of courage. Dude, it's, do you see now why it's way easier just to come in and just preach a message and be like, look how good of a Christian I am? Let me give you. Let me give you a nice message and sing you a nice song. And then everybody goes home and feels really good about themselves, but it doesn't change a darn thing. It changes nothing. And I am tired of all the weight falling on a bunch of kids. Man, I watched this video and all these riots were going on, and I watched this dad yell at this 16-year-old. It changed everything for me, yelling at this 16-year-old. And he ends up saying in this conversation, he says, we didn't get it. I'm 30 years old, and I'm still angry, and we didn't get it. He's 40 years old. He's still angry. He, does, he, we, he didn't get it. He's 60 years old. He's angry. He didn't get it. It's your job to figure it out. Dude, I just broke down crying. Because so I was like, it's not the 16-year-old jobs to figure it out. It's the 40, the 30, the 50, the 60-year-olds who never did the work to show up and start doing the work now. You may be late, but it tells us in Scripture that even the worker who shows up late gets the same pay. So just because you're showing up late to the job doesn't mean you won't get the same inheritance in the same wage. You'll get the same breakthrough as the 20-year-old if you show up in your humility with your scars showing and go, I've jacked this thing up, been married married twice, ruined the kids, I don't know what to do, the whole thing's falling apart, and I need a breakthrough. And we all get in a circle of men and go, we're going to do this together. No, pro, no more pretending it's okay, no more waiting for your kids to figure it out, no more waiting for your spouses to figure it out. It's time for men to wake up and hear the charge that you must go first in order for things to change. And by the way, powerful women do not make weak men. Powerful women are an opportunity for you to step the heck up. And if you feel insecure around powerful women, that's on you, not on them. Stop trying to bring them down to your level so that you feel better about you. Start trying to get up to theirs and go beyond. It's an invitation. I love my wife, dude. She'll, she has no problem put me in my place. I'm like, thank God for that. I have learned more by submitting to my wife than I ever have submitting to some fathers in the churches. I 
I'm like, she's right. And I need to heed this and listen to it. It kills my pride, it kills my ego, and it builds our faith and it builds our connectedness. Because we're yielding to each other in that way. She's like, that is a stupid, dis-. she doesn't even use nice words, which is like my love language. Anybody, <laughs> like my, my, it's like my love language is words, and she's like, that is a stupid, terrible, horrible, awful idea. It's so dumb. And I'm like, I'm not quite sure how to defend myself in this because she's right. Now that I'm looking at it, it's a very terrible, stupid, dumb, awful idea. I just wish you said it nicer. <laughs> Could you package that differently next time, please? I appreciate it, babe. Thank you so much. But she doesn't have to. Why? Because I know she loves me. And if I don't know that she loves me, that's on me, not her. When your spouse calls you out, it's not like, well, you hurt my feelings, so I'm not doing it because you hurt my feelings. Listen, you insecure adolescent little boy, grow up. We have too many adolescents in men's bodies leading organizations and leading churches, and we wonder why all we're able to do is reproduce adolescents. You want to know how the culture is run by adolescents? It's very, very easy to tell. Celebrities have more authority in your house than teachers. And football players are paid more than doctors. That's what kids do. Do you hear what I'm saying? When the person on TikTok has more authority in your house than the mom or the dad, we have built this thing upside down. And the truth is, until, until kids have an actual encounter with real masculinity and real motherhood, there is no chance for them to ever turn in a different direction. It's why we settle for celebrity instead of presence in the church all the time. In fact, I'll prove it to you that it's in the church. Here's how I'll prove it to you. If you name your favorite pastor and your favorite preacher, I want you to tell me their wife's names, their kids' names, and how often you pray for them and not the, not the man. That's how I know you like their gift more than the man and you care very little about whether or not their life looks like hell behind the scenes because you don't care as long as they show up with their gift. And we wonder why these people fall. They fall and then we blame them, but it's our fault. It's our fault. Because we worship these people, idolize them, put them on platforms that no human beings are ever supposed to sustain. Guys, what did, listen, if our, again, let's go back. If Jesus is our model, what did Jesus do every time they tried to lift him up and put him in front of people? What did he do? Disappeared and ran away. Where are those men? We're like, what, you want to lift me up and put me in stuff? He's like, okay. You want, to, you want to put me in front of stuff? That's so cool. How high can I, how high can I get up here? Like, am I allowed to be, can, is it good? And then we wonder when this thing starts to wobble, why it starts to wobble. Because it was never meant to hold people. It was meant to hold presence. Oh, you want to know how jacked up the language is? We have altar calls where you come and get something instead of giving something. An altar is where you come to die, not ask God for stuff. We put sacrifices on the altar, not laying hands for more gifts. In fact, you would get, you would get freaking smoked if you were in the Old Testament and you went up and tried to take something off the altar, woo! Is we're talking pillar of salt time. You know what I mean? Like that's like some crazy stuff. But now we just we're good with it. Let's make men and women amazing and put them on platforms. No, I am royalty because of who my daddy is, not because of where my position is on earth. Can you see how this starts to get really, really complicated and how it's a massive web that we cannot, you cannot Facebook about this. You cannot make videos and podcasts about this. It has to be one man, which this is what the Lord told me. I was going after marriages for a long time and I'm going to wrap up with this. You guys usually go hours and hours and hours, but I don't have that kind of stamina. I'm an old man. I'm just, I'm burning for this so bad. We went after marriages for a long time. And then we had a spiritual father come up to us. He says, man, you really want marriages? Let me tell you how to get marriages. Go get a man. 
And immediately what the Lord said to me is one man equals one marriage, which equals one family, which means we have one generation. We won. If you get one man, and how do I know that? Not just scripturally, men love your wives, Christ loves the church. We go through all that. Jesus is the model. Do you know that Newsweek did an article in a magazine, did an article about divorce and marriage? And you want to know how they ended the article? At the end of the article, it says 85 to 90% of all marriages that are in trauma will course correct over time if the man simply decides not to leave. Did you hear that? No church, no counseling. The man simply decides, I ain't going anywhere. It will course correct eventually. And here's what we all ask. This is what we'd all ask. David asked it in the Psalms. We would all ask it, which is, how long? That's what we all want to know. Every man or woman who's in a marriage trauma, they always want to ask me the same thing. How long? And I go, the question isn't how long for you. The question is, who is your model and how long would he wait for you? Because if God told you in your marriage, it's going to course correct. Your kids are going to come home. This is all going to happen. And it's going to happen in six years, three months, and two days. You'd be like, Okay, let's do it. You know what I mean? Like, we're like, we can kind of pump ourselves up and go. But instead, God, you go, how long? And he goes, trust me. Oh, that takes a real sense of security. That's why the definition of masculinity is unmovable and unshakable in any and all circumstance and seasons. That's how you know you found a man. Because they don't move. It's not personality. Like, some people, like, want to be like, well, no, like, I, you know, I love, like, the men, the men who, like, I love all of you who, like, hunt and kill stuff. And then you, like, go on vacation and you camp. Like, pretending to be homeless for a weekend is not my sense of vacation. Like, that's not me. I'm like, y'all can pretend to be homeless and call it a vacation, start your own fires, like... I mean, I'm, that's cool. I'll probably be in a hotel room. It's possible I'll be getting a massage later this afternoon. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, but the point is, is it's the difference between personality and masculinity. See, neither defines masculinity. It's just personality. You like camping, hunting, fishing. Awesome. I actually love going, I like, when I get with guys like that, I'm like, yeah, me too. You know? And then I'm like, see you at the art museum later. And they're like, uh, I don't think so, man. But I love it because it's different personalities. It's not masculinity. See, masculinity is when the world shakes. Oh, I love this. The world shakes and the man is like, we got this. Are you scared? Nope. Are you sad? Yes. I can have emotion and not be led by them. I am very sad. My heart is broken but I am not going to move. Look at Jesus. Jesus stands in front of Pilate. And Pilate's like, don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? And he says, you have no authority. I love this. You have no authority except for that which was given to you by my father. And then he says this, which this will be a freebie as well. As he says, You have no authority except for what was given to you by my father, which means he's saying, you're not taking my life. I'm giving it to you because men go first. And then he says, if my disciple, and because my kingdom is not of this world, if it was, my disciples would fight and you would lose. Oh, dude, did you hear this? I want you to hear this and then I'll give you context. He says, if my disciples were of this world, they would fight you but because they're not, they're going to give their lives up too, right? This is what he's telling us. So all of us who are busy yelling at government for how they're doing it all wrong still don't trust God enough to work it out the way he has planned because we're trying to operate in the same way the world operates. You are not from this kingdom. You don't have to stand up and fight government. You are a part of a better government. You are a part of an eternal throne room that has no end. Your king never gets off the throne. 
And if it really want, if really want to mess with your head, then G- God put Pilate in places of power so that Jesus could give up his life so that we could be redeemed. And that was God's will, crucifying Christ before the foundation of the world. He also put in power Nebuchadnezzar. That'll mess you up. Do you see how this gets really confusing? If we aren't secure in who we were meant to be in Christ, we will find a thousand ways to display it in the world because we never want to look in the mirror. And we need men in this hour who are willing to pay the price not to move. And when everybody is shouting and everybody's yelling at a thousand different powers, real men are standing firm in who they are and who Christ is. And they do not move. Because they know Yahweh, they know his voice, they know Abba, they know his space. They felt the work of the Holy Spirit, they know his voice, they know his leading, and they do not move. Did you hear of all the stuff that's happening? I heard it, my heart breaks, and I am moving in the same direction. I am not changing course. It is my family, it is my community, Christ above all. My eyes are fixed. My life is secure. And I am not moving. And everyone's running around. And there's just a couple guys. And I'd be like, why are you not freaking out? Oh, because I'm attached to a better kingdom. How do I get that? And they start to grab your arm. When they grab your arm... You go, here's how you do this. Walk with me for a few months. See it in my life and then repeat it in your own. And then that man does it. And then that man does it. And they do it in their marriage. And they do it in their family. And they do it with their kids. One man, one marriage, one family, one generation completely transformed. Thank you for listening to the message of the week. If you would like to partner with the podcast or find out more information about The Shepherd's Tent, please visit us at theshepherdstent.com.